Partners. Jeffrey Moss is founder and partner of Parker Dewey, and Julia Giron is manager of the Eden Education Partner Program at HubSpot. Welcome to you both. Hello. Good morning. Hey. So I'm going to start out by asking you each to introduce yourselves and tell me a little bit about your roles at your companies. And uh, Julia, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure. Well, thanks so much for having us this morning and whoever is attending for waking up early or wherever you might be. Um, my name is Julia. I go, have she, I go by she, her pronouns. I'm the manager of, of the Education Partner Program at HubSpot, which is a CRM SaaS company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but has almost, I would say, 60% of its employees remote and all across the world right now. Um, my program specifically um, is meant to oversee all of the academic relationships that HubSpot has with colleges and universities worldwide. And we're starting to expand into workforce development and things like that, but we're not really deep into that, so I won't go into it yet. Um, our goal is to, uh, essentially make sure that all of the education that HubSpot creates is delivered to the college and university space via professors who would teach it in their class, whether it's something specific to our software or our methodology, which we call inbound or the flywheel, if anyone has heard of that, and then to plug those students into our ecosystem, make sure that they're employed ideally by our customers or by our solutions partners, but really anywhere that they're happy and anywhere that they won't end up underemployed. Um, and so, that is our goal, is to basically skill people up and plug them into our ecosystem. Um, and I've been at HubSpot for about two and a half years. I lead a team of three. We're small and mighty. Um, and we do a lot of great stuff, which I know we'll get into this morning. That's wonderful, Julia. Jeff, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your role and about Parker Dewey. Yeah, thanks so much and great to be here. Um, my background is I, I was actually an investor in education and technology for about 20 years working with colleges, K-12 institutions, organizations, and the like, really focused on how do, we, um, how do we improve the education delivered to students and learners at all stages in their lives and career. And about six years ago, launched Parker Dewey because I saw a specific area of challenge, that college to career transition. While so many efforts were focused on how do we provide college accessibility or how do we reskill or upskill adults who are already in the workforce, again, all very, very important, there was this huge miss focused on college to career. Everyone assumed it was someone else uh, handling it. Oh, if a college student doesn't have a job upon graduation, it's the quote unquote fault of the student for not trying harder, or it's the fault of the school for not preparing them, or the fault of the company for not looking beyond GPA or academic pedigree. And while everyone was sort of pointing fingers, we saw this emergence of the gig economy that for the first time, companies were becoming more and more comfortable working with individuals outside of the four walls of their organization on projects. Now it started off with a focus on geographic arbitrage. Let me send it over to another country for pennies on the dollar. Um, but what I recognized was, was it actually created something else. This acceptance of the gig economy created a new way for companies to engage and assess college students and others early in their career while providing college students opportunities to get valuable professional experiences. And to be clear, we're not suggesting replacing full-time jobs or summer internships or co-op programs with gigs by any stretch, but the recognition that we can use these gigs as a pathway to something more meaningful. Or as one of the college students described it earlier on, it's like dating. It's like going on a date before the engagement of a summer internship and marriage of a full-time role. And that's very much what we've tried to do with this concept of the micro internship. That is a, that's a great overview. I, I wanna get a little bit into the weeds on the micro internships. Um, what does a micro internship look like? How is it different from a traditional internship experience? Sure. Yeah, um, yeah when, we, when we sort of pioneered this concept six years ago, we define micro internships very, very specifically short term paid professional projects completed by college students or recent grads on behalf of busy professionals. And just to unpack that a little bit, short term means these are projects that take a college student typically anywhere from five to say 40 hours to complete, not per day or per week, but in total. And they're professional. This is not walk my dog, drive me somewhere, pick up my, uh, my sushi delivery. 
but rather real projects that are similar to what you would give an intern or a new hire. And we think about them as the we shoulds and the I shouldn'ts. We should go write an article on a new topic. We should go see what our competitors are doing. But we just don't have enough time in the day. Or the I shouldn'ts. I shouldn't be the one sort of cleansing this data list or doing this research for an upcoming conference or doing a first draft of an article. Real valuable professional assignments, but for someone with five or 10 or 20 years of professional experience, not the highest and best. Those are perfect examples of these micro internships. So again, short term, professional and paid. 100% of the micro internships are paid and paid fairly. So we're not talking about you're going to be paid 50 bucks for something that's going to take you 10 hours of work, but rather paid fairly and in line with what a college student, a recent grad would be getting in his or her first professional role upon graduation. Applicable across company sizes. So over the past six years, we've seen them used by one person startups all the way through Fortune 100 companies. Um, they're applicable across industries, technology, education, healthcare, you name it, um, and across departments, really allowing students to learn about different roles and departments, especially, again, and I'm sure Julia will get into this later, for those, um, those college students that have majors that don't sound like job titles. How am I supposed to know what to do with my philosophy degree because no companies, not even innovative ones like HubSpot, have the job title of philosopher? Well, this lets the philosophy major understand and apply those research, problem solving, communication skills, et cetera. Sorry for the long winded answer. No, that's great. That's great. And, and all the philosophy students out there um, and parents of philosophy students uh, are very welcoming to hear that um, as well. Um, Julia, I'm, I'm really interested to hear about how micro internships fit into the overall student engagement picture because it's, it's a tool, but it's not the only tool. So how does, how does it work at HubSpot? Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about um, how HubSpot is thinking of applied learning and experiential learning because Parker Dewey is not our first time at the rodeo. Um, and we've experimented with different things that I think worked pretty well in some regards. I think Parker Dewey so far has been like, we're hitting the ball out of the park on sort of all of the metrics that we, uh, that we are assessing. Um, so a little bit about our motivation behind doing this. Um, we and I love to think that we're doing good all the time, but the bottom line is that we're part of a business. And so we need to prove our value to HubSpot um, as a really important part of what makes it healthy. And so, like I said, and I, I hope I don't sound too much like a broken record, but we upskill students, we arm professors with the tools that they need to do that, and then we insert them back into the ecosystem that makes it easier for solutions partners to find entry level talent, which they have bemoaned is very difficult. It makes it easier for our customers to find entry level talent and in internships. It is just healthier for the overall ecosystem. And so even though what motivates us to maybe go into work every day um, is to essentially do good. And I think that's, I can probably speak for the whole team. Um, our, our raison d'etre is that we need to prove our value to the business and applied learning and specifically micro internships have been really good at that. Um, when we were talking a little bit, uh, well, prior to Parker Dewey, when we were experimenting with it, we had a process wherein we would essentially expect um, professors to be project managers. So we would set up a professor who was maybe teaching a marketing 101 class for the sake of an example, um, and we'd connect them to a customer who was super excited to work with them. But then the professor would be the middle person between all of this. And professors are amazing. They do so much. They're probably underpaid. If there's any professors listening to this, you might agree. For, for what they do, it's so valuable to society and to the students that are in their classes. Asking them to be a project manager for this task or for this project is, is a lot. And so the professors that we had in our kind of pilot project really enjoyed the experience. But they said, it's, it's not for everyone. I, I could do it, but it's not for everyone. And so we asked ourselves, well, how do we democratize it? How do we remove bottlenecks? And I don't mean that in a bad way, but professors were essentially kind of the bottlenecks for some, some of this information that they needed to then convey to the students. How do we remove that and democratize this process so that any student can find a way to plug themselves into the ecosystem and they're not reliant on their professor? And Parker Dewey is what's allowed us to do that. Um, outside of that, though, I did want to kind of provide some examples of 
this working out really well for us. Um, so for example, um, we have had, there's two stories that I'd like to share. Um, there's an intern that was working on uh, at University of New Hampshire, who was, sorry, not an intern, but I'll get to that. Um, so someone named Hannah, actually, uh, she was a student at the University of New Hampshire. She was doing small projects through this small business development commission that is on University of New Hampshire's campus, doing small projects for uh, different uh, businesses in her community. She got an internship at a solutions partner uh, last summer and then got an internship at HubSpot this summer and is getting a full-time offer at HubSpot when she's uh, graduated. So not everyone can be Hannah, but what I'm saying is there is a pathway. Once you start experiential learning, once you start doing these small projects and you're able to prove your value, sorry, to, to a business, you're able to then, you, you carry that momentum with you. Um, and I have other examples that I can share, but I won't be too long winded here. Um, but there's great ways for people to plug themselves into the ecosystem. And I think with micro internships, it is a lot easier than it has been in the past. Well, I, I think but you've hit on some really important points um, because Hannah, your great uh, you know, example, started out with the small pieces and grew skills. And that enabled her to go to the next point, which is the first internship. And then that enabled her to go to the next one. And a lot of times what we're seeing is this gap where students don't have the opportunity to make those first small steps in an actual business type environment or an actual professional environment that, you know, that goes across all skill um, types before they can get to the point where they're really hireable outside. And so what I'm seeing here is, is this is the tiny step that gets you to the step that a lot of people look to now is let's just do an internship, but those internships, it's hard. Um, it's, and there's small soft skills that are involved in that too. It's, you know, you get to work at a certain time and you, um, you know, are ready to work when you get there. And you also, you know, understand how to write a, a you know, a business email or those sorts of things. And this is one of those small steps that gets you to the bigger step. Yeah, I, no, I would, I would totally agree. And there's a whole bunch of other really interesting aspects to it too. And I think Julia hit on them. Um, first of all, by making it just a small project, you can actually change behavior as well and change behavior for hiring managers and the college students. So on the hiring manager side, again, everyone is highly, highly focused on enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is wonderful and it's important. And everyone recognizes that where you go to school and your GPA doesn't necessarily predict if you're going to be a good hire. But when you have something that is viewed as higher stakes, like a 10 week summer internship, where I'm going to have someone in the office and I'm going to be responsible for taking them out to lunch, et cetera, et cetera. Hiring managers, as much as we might not want to admit to it, continue to revert to we only recruit from certain schools, majors and GPAs because it's perceived as high stakes. Again, back to that engagement metaphor, there's a reason there's no engagement dating apps where the first step is getting engaged because, again, you don't want to jump into something that high stakes. By lowering the stakes to this specific project, hiring managers are more willing and open to try people from different schools or majors. They're not giving that pushback on the university recruiters of, nah, I don't really want to interview that person with a 3-2 or that person that didn't go to an Ivy League school. The reason it works, though, I think hits back to something Julia said, which is it creates value for everyone. And that's really the trick of with micro internships. And by the way, when I talk about micro internships, it's not about Parker Dewey. It's about micro internships, whether you do them through our platform or not. So the value of the micro internship is the individual hiring manager, the person in sales or marketing or whatever department says, here's a way for me to offload the project that's not the highest and best use of my time, those we shoulds and I shouldn't. They're seeing value from those immediate projects without adding to the friction of the cost. The person on the university recruiting team is saying, oh, here's a way to access students that might not be aware of our brand or access students at schools we don't go to or drive diversity by looking beyond GPA or retraining my hiring manager that GPA and academic pedigree aren't the right predictors. The student at the same time is also seeing that value. Here's a way to get some experience. 
And here's a way to learn di about different careers and career paths. So I might have my heart set on working at a Silicon Valley startup, but gosh, let me go do a project for HubSpot and realize I don't have to work at a startup. I can work at a more established firm and still get the innovation and technology that I'm hungry for. Again, it lets them try that date. And then finally with the universities, I think back to Julia's point, here's a way of tying experiential learning in the classroom without taking away academic freedom or putting more work on the professor's plates. Here's a way to let those students sort of demonstrate and apply what they've learned, whether it's a more technical class, like some of the ones taught by HubSpot's education partners, or whether it's a philosophy class or a French class or humanities, where they're applying those strong research and communication skills. Well, that's, um, that, that's a good um, point philosophically and also operationally, I would think. Julia, how are you um, and HubSpot operationalizing the micro internship initiative? I know this is still fairly new for you. Can you speak to how you're engaging professors and students and how you're doing that at an operational level? Sure. Um, I would say like for anyone interested in this, there's certainly a lot of lessons that I can share, lessons learned. Um, I think the philosophy at HubSpot that has really helped us is pilot everything first. So we're not investing half a million of do dollars into micro internships from the get go. We're starting pretty small, um, depending on your philosophy that might be called unambitious by some, but we want to start small because we don't want this to fail and we want it to grow slowly. And so we're starting with around 20 matches, which for a company of HubSpot size is actually quite small. Um, so we want to start small and then expand from there and in a very deliberate and intentional way. Um, so in terms of operationalizing it, like I said, I won't be a broken record, but I'll just kind of harken back to my previous point about really proving the value to the business. This is important not because we're going to do good for society, which of course some people might be motivated by that, but it's going to make it easier for those who create revenue for HubSpot, not our team, but those who create revenue for HubSpot to find talent, to diversify the talent that they might have. Um, so this is going to really hit those points that everyone is kind of thinking about now. It's a really timely discussion to have as well. Um, and in terms of just basic money, right? So you have to ask for, I have to ask for money from folks, my boss, my boss's boss, my boss's boss's boss to make this happen. And I think once you have a very good foundation of why you even exist in the first place, it is a lot easier to try and, and ask for that money and to network around and see if anyone can join your team. Um, and then I have to kind of mention this as well. Um, Parker Dewey has been fantastic. I feel like I have a team <laughs> of a micro internships team that is not employed by HubSpot. So for example, um, I, I don't know, and Jeffrey can kind of speak to how other companies might do this, but we wanted a lot of control over this pilot. So we had our own, we built our own website, we built our own landing pages, which Parker Dewey already does, but we wanted something that didn't seem like a uh, whiplash, right? Like you, you go from a HubSpot website to this other company called Parker Dewey. What is it? I don't know if I trust it. So we wanted to have kind of like control 80 to 90% of the journey and then pass people off to Parker Dewey at the end. And so for a team, like I mentioned, that is so small, that was actually really scary and really ambitious, even though we weren't really willing to compromise on that piece. And so once we were able to pass people off, it was great because we didn't have to put students and uh, customers in the wild west, right? It's like you have your own customer success manager at Parker Dewey in the same way you might have a customer success manager at HubSpot if you're a customer. So we're passing you on to people who will be able to support you, even if they're not HubSpot employees. And that transition from working with HubSpot and enjoying it, hopefully, it's kind of seamless to working with Parker Dewey and enjoying that experience of hiring a micro intern as well. So operationally, it's, I don't have much to say just because Parker Dewey has made it so easy for us. But to Jeffrey's point, wherever you decide to start your micro internships program, definitely look for a partner in it. Because um, I feel like Parker Dewey has been a partner to us and they've made our lives so easy. <laughs> You're making Cavell. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I mean, that, that's, that's kind. Um, and, and you guys have been amazing. And um, again, I, I appreciate all of the kind words about Parker Dewey. 
everything though we're hitting on are things that organizations can do on their own. I mean, we like to believe we can make it much, much easier. Um, so for to the question about how to operationalize it, look, we're, we're happy to work with you. Also happy to just share best practices. But what we've seen is really two different approaches that companies have followed. And again, I'm talking on the company side, happy to talk about the university side as well. On the company side, the two different approaches are one, just ad hoc projects. One of the things that we've seen over the past six years is every professional has these we shoulds and I shouldn'ts. What we found is those professionals are doing it themselves. They're visiting the Parker Dewey site, they're posting the project, we've developed all of these templates over the past six years to make it really, really easy, and they're simply posting the project and putting it on their purchasing card or credit card or whatever individual project on average to again the question about cost we've seen the typical project costs the company about 350 or 400 bucks that is the total cost to the company of an individual project and that's not 300 bucks that goes into our pocket that's 300 bucks where 90 percent goes to the student we do keep 10 percent of each project done on our platform but what that does is it lets us handle some of those operational things and what I mean by that is the student, when the student's doing a project on behalf of HubSpot or Pepsi or G2 or anyone else, they're not an employee or contractor of that company. They're actually on Parker Dewey's book. So back to some of those administrative challenges, how do you figure that out without having to fill out 100 different 1099s or W2s? Well, Parker Dewey does that on behalf of the clients, which is why we take that 10%. But I digress. Individual managers can go and post those projects and put it on their credit card and not get in trouble from HR because there's none of the HR burdens. And then, by the way, if the individual manager says, gosh, I loved working with Julia, I want to hire her directly as a summer intern or full time hire. Awesome. No temp to perm or conversion fee. So those individual projects become very, very useful. The second way we've seen organizations do it is more like what Julia described, where they're doing small programs. Again, we're not suggesting that HubSpot is going to throw out the entire campus recruiting process that it built over the past number of years, especially given the success they're having. But rather what they're doing is they're identifying a specific challenge. We are having trouble finding students who are sophomores with a focus on non-technical majors because we think they could be really good. So let's do a small program to tap into that and see the results or we're trying to drive more diversity. Let's engage our ERGs or BRGs in this to provide opportunities where the ERG members view it as a perk to get some of that immediate support on those projects that they don't want to do. But we can also use it to enhance our diversity recruiting to get to know students and again, expose them to members of our company who might not look like Jeffrey. Um, so we're seeing a lot of those also and again, those programs can be 10 micro internships, 20, 50. But again, our suggestion is smart, start with a small program to prove it out. And what we've seen is as the hiring managers get wind of it from other departments, they get excited because here's a way to get some of that immediate support on projects in a way that's also having positive social impact. It's that alignment again, business and social impact. So we have some nuts and bolts questions from the audience that I want to kind of um, address. One of them is, um, you know, we're one 10 hour project with one student is something, but what can you aggregate a group of students like, you know, bring five in to work on a project? Is that something that anybody's done before? Um, and Julie, I know your program is fairly new. Jeff, can you speak to that? Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, working with five students, we've seen two different approaches. One is similar to the capstone approach that um, I saw the question from the audience ask. Um, we've seen companies do that. The flip side is back to Julia's point about professors not wanting to play project manager. We find professionals don't want to play project manager either. Um, so again, we've certainly done that and seen it and we're happy to facilitate it. Um, but we just want to make sure that the professional um, at the company understands that, hey, this is a little different and there is going to be a time commitment. What we've also seen, and one of our uh, one of the clients uh, that we've worked with calls it American Idol, is they might bring in five students to all work on a project independently. So we're going to assign each of the five students a different industry or different geography or different topic. We're going to let them all go do the project so they're not stepping on each other's toes, and then we're going to get all five back. 
And what it's going to do is get us five articles written that we want to publish or five sets of customer leads or five whatever. So we're going to get all of this work back, but it's also going to let us compare and contrast the work. So when Jeffrey did the project, did he do a good job or a great job versus Julia? And that way they're using it to, again, get the work, but also compare and contrast as they're building that recruiting pipeline. So we see a lot of that as well. And then from the student's perspective, they're still getting those valuable experiences along with making a couple of bucks. So I have a couple of geography questions for you. Um, for, is this US exclusive? I know HubSpot is not US exclusive. Is this, um, are micro internships just something you're seeing in the US? You're seeing them abroad? No, we've, we've seen them globally and, and Julia can talk to this. We've seen a lot of international HubSpot clients um, sort of signing up to post the projects. Um, everything that we do has some kind of a U.S. tie, whether it's a U.S.-based student, meaning a, a U.S. citizen who's attending university in the U.S. It could be an international student attending university in the U.S. or a U.S. citizen attending school elsewhere. Um, so with some of the international companies, we're seeing them say, we're based in Singapore, um, we're a HubSpot user, We'd like to find students who are originally from Singapore, but are attending university in the U.S. going through HubSpot's program. Here's a great way to do that. Um, so, and again, Julie, I'm not sure if you have more to add around that. Yeah. Um, so as a quick story, when we started this pilot, because we wanted it to be so small, and I, I said, you know, I've gone into my control issues in the previous question. Um, one of the stipulations was that you had to be a HubSpot customer in good standing in the US. And we had to remove that almost like two or three days after we started the program because there was so much interest from other folks. And this, this is not a way for me to say, you know, they weren't reading the fine print, but it, it, was a good, it was a good piece of friction for us because we realized that there's a massive amount of interest in employing these students. And I can't speak to micro internships and if there's, it's sort of like a, a more ubiquitous in other countries. I'm not sure about that piece, but there was just so much interest. So we have folks in Israel, we have folks in Russia, in Chile. I, the list goes on. I would say we have a pretty healthy mix of US-based customers um, that have global operations outside of the US perhaps, and also those uh, that are based in other countries. And one other question is, you know, Jeff, I, I'm from the way you've been talking, a lot of these micro internships seems like they, the person is actually coming into the company. They're coming on site and doing the internships. And in today's COVID environment, I'm not sure that that's accurate. I, I, you pro, I don't know if you have a mix or not. Yeah, I, I, and, and sorry for that. Pre COVID, about 96, 97% of micro internships were remote. So pre COVID, they were being done remote. In the COVID world, I haven't run the numbers recently, but it's, it's probably north of 99%. So this was not some pivot or change or um, newfangled solution to COVID. And what we found, and this also hits the geography question, is what we found is this democratizes the process for students and companies alike. So I am a company like HubSpot based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Obviously it's great because there's so many schools in Boston, but what about my ability to provide micro internships to someone who's studying at university in Texas or Florida or Washington or California? This becomes a great way to build that relationship and engage that individual who might want to return to Boston. Or if you think about, and, and again, HubSpot is fortunate that they're in this location with so many colleges and universities. We've been doing things in Kansas, for instance, with companies that are based in Kansas or companies based in Ohio that may not have as many local colleges, but have this great group of individuals who are from those geographies and would love to return home, but aren't necessarily aware of what options are there. Here's a way to start to build that relationship. To again, show them that you don't have to go to Silicon Valley to do interesting work in technology, or show them that the tire company in Akron, Ohio, isn't just uh, roles on the factory floor, that there's technology and marketing and strategy and sales and all of these different opportunities for those individuals that may want to return home upon graduation or go to a different geography. 
And Julia, I think you have some, um, you got some, a little bit of a surprise and some really great results from um, engaging with schools that you might not have been engaged with before. Absolutely. Um, so the way that we kind of communicated the micro internship program launching was simply through email and marketing as a marketing company. It was pretty easy for us to just send it out to anyone who would, with whom it would be relevant. So we sent the information out to professors. We also were able to segment all of our contacts to see who is a student in the last two or three years um, and sent it out to them. So I think in total, the email might've gone to about 14, 1400, uh, sorry, 14,000 folks um, over the course of two or three days. And so you might hear that and say, well, 78, that's not, that's not that big. But, Again, our program started super small. And I know some of the questions from the audience are like, what are lessons learned? It is not, it, don't take it personally when you wanna start small. Don't let people say that you're unambitious or you're not trying hard enough. It starts small because the stakes can be really high for a student that is disappointed for an experience. You want to have that full control over, well, not full control, because you can't ever have full control, but you know what I mean. Like you want to have as much control as possible to make sure it's as positive an experience as possible for a student and for a customer. Um, so the way that we kind of communicated about it was just through email and then following up. Did you see my email earlier about the micro internships? There's a lot that our program, I would say probably, this isn't the question, but kind of connects. One of the weaknesses of our program is that we have professors that come to us all the time that tell us about great stuff that they're doing. And so we are most exposed to those professors. There are professors who are doing amazing things that might not need to tell us all the time. And we would love to know about it, but at the same time, we shouldn't expect that either. So we would send information about these micro internships and these professors come out of the weeds saying, oh, I do that too. Is there any way that we can kind of work together or Oh, I think my students would love this. And I'm like, I forgot you were in this program. That's so great that we're reconnecting because of this. And so um, it's allowed us, we have about 1800 professors in the program across 110 uh, universities around the world. Um, so we can't be in these one-on-one -on -one communications with professors. And so whenever they have this positive news, for, uh, positive news that we give them, whether they're interested in micro internships immediately or not, it's a great way for us to build that connection with them. And have you seen a lot of times we hear at UIDP we're, we're working on an initiative to engage HBCUs and connect them with industry that's very interested in, in engaging to build that talent pipeline and, and get those great um, grads into their industries. What has been the response um, that you've seen from underrepresented universities? Yeah, so the micro, so if anyone is interested in micro, micro internships more generally, there's obviously Parker Dewey, but there's a lot of universities doing amazing things and a lot of professors at the helm of these initiatives. Um, one that I will just really quickly plug is Cal State Channel Islands. They have their own micro initiative, micro, micro internship initiative. They don't use Parker Dewey, but they actually use HubSpot to run their program and they connect with smaller businesses in the Ventura County area. Um, there are tons of models for this. And Cal State Channel Islands is a large public school in California, extremely diverse state, extremely diverse campus, um, and also a Hispanic serving institution. So that's one of the reasons why I'm bringing that up. Um, UNH, which I mentioned before, they have a student run agency, which does these smaller projects through the Small Business uh, Development Commission in New Hampshire. Um, there are a lot of models out there for, for making this work. Um, one of the things that I can say though, from HubSpot's perspective, is that these micro internships, as Jeffrey kind of alluded to earlier, there's a lot of social capital that maybe the three of us don't realize goes into working. Showing up on time, writing thank you notes, um, what are other things? I mean, really think about all these things that you do that you kind of take for granted because you've been in a professional space for a very long time, but someone did teach you that or you were exposed to it and you realized through patterns that that was the right thing to do. And so there's so much social capital that goes into making a good impression and not everyone has that. That's a privilege that a lot of people are exposed to it earlier in their careers and a lot of students don't have that. So micro internships is a great way very low stakes way to just be like, hey, I noticed that you have, you do this, just letting you know when you are full-time remote or full-time 40 hours a week, every week, you might not want to do that. I'm just looking out for you. 
And it's a great way for you to teach students those skills too. Now, I'm not saying that all underrepresented students don't have those skills, but there's certainly something to be said about social capital and how micro internships can help in that. The other thing that I did wanna mention, again, just to bring this kind of back to life is talk about our relationship with Howard University. So HubSpot actually is opening a center for digital business at Howard unrelated to micro internships. We have had such success with Howard University in particular. Um, we, our internship class, at least for, for marketing interns, because we have interns all across the, all across the uh, organization, but I can speak mostly to the marketing interns because that's my team. Um, I wanna say maybe between 40 and 55% of them come from an HBCU. So not just Howard, but from other HBCUs. And that we started at zero um, and that wasn't long ago. So one of the things that is really helpful for us is in addition to you know, promoting these micro internships and making our program safe for those who want to start kind of getting a taste of HubSpot is not just parachuting in. Um, so our, our relationship with Howard was slow and intentional. We didn't just drop in during career fairs and show up once a year during those or twice a year. We came when there was nothing to be gained. We traveled up to DC or we traveled to the Clark Atlanta University Consortium Schools just to say hi. Um, and I didn't, when I say we, I mean our university recruiting team. So I can't take credit for that. There's a lot that can be learned from just being present on campus. And I, I have to say, I think this is representative of all students, not just students at HBCUs, but their BS meter is very good. So if you show up on campus twice a year, but say you're committed to making sure their experience is great and you're committed to all of these things, but you don't show up any other time. And by show up, I don't just mean physically because that's not always possible, but you're not present any other time. You're not present in their classes. You're not present in their curriculum they're going to be very slick to that. And they're going to know, especially because the bar is high for companies these days that, that create an inclusive culture. So they're going to know that it's probably not a good place to work. So it has, I can only speak for our university recruiting thing, but it has taken time. And I think our Howard relationship is a really healthy one. Um, we're trying to obviously expand to other HBCUs as well. Um, Morgan State is a great partner of ours as well. Um, but it's, it's very slow, very intentional, but we've kind of operationalized it at this point, and we expect to have a lot of HBCU uh, applications in our pipeline for our summer internships in 2022. Um, and so the bar is high for us, um, and we were able to kind of do that because we had a good foundation with that. And I, I have got to interject here. Like, what Julia just talked about is why, again, irrespective of the Parker Dewey stuff, why I just think HubSpot is absolutely amazing. They have this figured out. You cannot just show up. The students know. They talk about the fact that I go to the company's website and they talk about diversity and they have the picture of someone that looks like me, but I go to interview and everyone looks like Jeffrey. Or they, again, show up twice a year. Howard University, great example. Again, when they're, they as a school, so for the universities on here, they as a school have realized this as well, which is why they're sending emails and engaging their employers saying, here are other ways to engage our students and get to know them. You can't just show up at the career fair and expect it to work. And again, HubSpot has made a real investment in it. But what I love is seeing so many of the schools providing ways for those employer partners to do it. And it's not just the Howards and, and the Moore houses and the Morgan States. I mean, Norfolk State is doing incredible work around this as well. Um, and again, what's great about it is it's both social impact and business. Think about all of the students that HubSpot is able to engage that its competitors are missing because they aren't showing up at those schools and they aren't building those relationships. I mean, that is pretty incredible. So again, sorry to interrupt. I just the work, the work is incredible. And again, we hear it from the schools that employers all want to show up to our career fair this year because diversity is, is a hot topic. Um, but it's not really, it's not working. Students are seeing through it. Well, one thing, not just, not just with HSS, not just with HBCUs, but just, there's a lot of students, um, undergrads and grad students that can't afford to do an unpaid internship for a semester. 
Um, yeah. You know, that's they just can't. And so they graduate without that in industry experience, that step in the door because they weren't they, there was no opportunity for them. So can you just speak a little bit to um, long term what the value is for employers because they've opened the gateway for students that otherwise would not have had this opportunity to to get in there and, and make themselves known? Yeah, I mean, this is I, I, this is a crazy topic. I mean, I, I made a comment a few months ago. I didn't even realize unpaid internships were still a thing. I mean, uh, let's let's ignore the questionable legality because there's a whole bunch of backdoors we see um, organizations and schools uh, or organizations in particular using to get around that. So we're going to tie it to in-class project or we're not going to call it an internship. We're going to call it uh, an opportunity to, to read content about our company and do a case. Um, and we're not going to pay you for it. Um, but if you do really well on this case, we're going to put you at the top of our recruiting list. I mean, those are unpaid internships, but even worse because you don't get to put it on your resume. Um, the impact is real. Again, what it does is it, it one means that you're only able to access or provide opportunities to those who can afford to work for free, which eliminates huge percentages of the population. Um, and not just those who have to have part-time jobs or full-time jobs to pay for school, but think about student athletes. I mean, companies recognize student athletes have those core skills they're looking for, the teamwork, communication, coachability, all of those skills student athletes have, but they get missed because they can't afford to do a free internship or they don't have the time to do a traditional summer internship or maybe their grades are a little bit lower. Um, but the other thing that's important is think about the signal you're sending. So Julia, we, we really want to recruit you. We think you're going to be great, but we're not going to pay you for your work. Like that's a pretty horrible signal. Um, and that's why, again, we're seeing so many of these questionable long-term outcomes. One of the things that we've seen is companies or students who do micro internships, when they accept their full-time role, 98% of them stay with the same company at least a year. I actually think that number is 18 or 24 months when we analyzed it, 98%. Now, while I'm bummed about that other 2%, the current data shows that 55% of all recent college grads leave their first job within the first year. Think about what that means. Think about the average cost of recruiting a college kids north of six grand, according to NACE, and you're having 55% of them leave within the first year. Again, maybe it's because you haven't built up that goodwill by giving them an unpaid internship, or maybe it's not the right fit or any number of reasons. Again, sorry to go off on the tangent. That's all right. I just, I, like unpaid internships are just, and I they think need to stop. They're becoming more rare. I really believe they're becoming more rare. I think that that is something that, you know, a couple of decades ago, we were seeing a lot more, but I think that there's recognition, yeah. but even a low paid look at internship them, but, is hard to, to, you know, sustain. Yeah. But look at And one thing, again, just to be the dead horse a bit, they are becoming more rare but they're also showing up is uh, the, the metaphorical wolf in sheep's clothing. Think about challenges. We're gonna, give, we're gonna give college students an opportunity to do a challenge. And the person who comes in first, we're gonna pay or give an offer to. What about the other hundred or thousand students that participated in that challenge? They were asked to essentially do work for free. And what that means is again, those students who did the free work, again, first of all, I'm not gonna put it on the resume, who wants to put on their resume, I did a challenge and lost. And secondly, they're only accessible to people who can commit all of that time to do free work, which again, eliminates huge percentages of the student population. So I agree with you, they are becoming more rare, but look at where they might be hiding under different names. Interesting, interesting. Sorry for my soapbox. <laughs> Well, I do want to ask this question, though. Um, so are there are, are there disciplines, certain disciplines that micro internships are better suited for? Um, does it work as well for your engineering candidate as it does for your economics candidate? Um, so who, who do these in micro internships work best for? I can start and then I'll kick it over to Julia, who is a liberal arts major in school. Um, we have found and again, over the past six years, we have found major has little to nothing to do with uh, getting selected for micro internships. So again, you could take the extreme examples of the philosophy major who knows how to research, communicate, um, effectively craft an argument, great, ton of projects for him or her where they can apply those skills learned in uh, philosophy class or 
the marketing major that's taking courses in HubSpot along with other things, again, working on HubSpot projects, but also working on projects that might not be directly tied to HubSpot. So what we've seen is major has little to nothing to do with who's selected or who's successful. What we're also seeing more and more are um, university programs that include almost a hybrid between uh, traditional liberal arts and more technical skills. So Purdue University in uh, West Lafayette's a great example. Through the College of Liberal Arts, they're doing things like Cornerstone and Degree Plus, which allows their uh, liberal arts students to also get more technical skills in areas like HubSpot, for instance. And you think about students who are the best prepared for full-time roles upon graduation, they have those great core skills, again, the problem solving, communication, et cetera, that are really honed through a liberal arts program, but they've also had the opportunity to apply them through coursework in more technical areas. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about my own experience as well. I kind of stumbled into tech, um, but as Jeffrey mentioned, I was a French major in college. And I think very quickly I had, I was so lucky to have people around me that said, I'm not going to tell you to minor in accounting, or I'm not going to tell you to learn a skill uh, that might be a little bit more practical or can ensure a paycheck or uh, kind of a professional career. But they, they were around to tell me like, during your summer internships, you need to show how well-rounded you are. Um, and I absolutely, you know, the first few years out of college, I was like, why did I major in French? Why did my parents allow me to do this? Um, but at the end of the day, the summer internships that I did kind of were um, very different from what I did in uh, over the course of the school year because I knew that I needed to show that I could do this and I could do that and I can do this other thing as well. Um, and so it was only because I was so intentional about how I spent my summer and how I showcased my experiences that you might not see in uh, during the school year um, that I was able to find a career outside of, of French um, and outside of you know, teaching French, for example. Um, and that has kind of snowballed into working in tech now and not speaking a lick of French and probably forgetting a lot of it, which I don't recommend. Um, but all of that to say, I work with Jeffrey very closely on this micro internship things, but I've also lived through knowing you need to be well-rounded. And there's one thing that I kind of want to mention as well, in case anyone here is interested, I was listening to a podcast recently um, and I'm trying to find it called the Future You Podcast. Um, and they interviewed uh, Matt Siegelman, who is the CEO of Burning Glass Technologies. And yep. something that he said really resonated with me. So I can't take credit for it, but he said, this is not about replacing the liberal arts education or the humanities education. It's actually about ensuring that it survives. So we're not saying, you know, doom and gloom to the French majors of the world. I really hope that we're not communicating that message. We're saying, do that and do this, and you will be more well-rounded. It's about helping you, because liberal arts majors, I think we all know, bring to the table amazing skills. They may not be able to articulate it right away, but they will be able to use the tools that are available to them, whether that's critical analysis or communication, to really be great contributions to a workforce. And so this is really about not replacing college or, and I don't think anyone has gotten that impression so far, but this is not about replacing anything. This is about complementing what already exists, especially for those students who are feeling that anxiety about graduating without a job or not knowing how to translate their major to a career. I want to oh hear my, a little oh, bit. Oh, wait, oh, again, I, I need to jump in. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Everyone needs to listen to this ton of, uh, it, not me, but what Julia said, ton of discussion around let's replace college with boot camps. Kids don't need to go to college. Why do these schools exist? Like those are really, really bad ideas. Those are really bad. Liberal arts is vital, especially when you, again, you look at the employer data that shows the skills that they most value aren't knowing how to use Excel or knowing how to read an accounting document, communication, problem solving, grit, critical thinking, like, those are the core skills. And by the way, those all align to the liberal arts program. Companies sit here surprised that they hire a computer science major that didn't take a liberal arts class in college and their communication skills suck. Nothing against computer science majors, but don't be surprised. 
or they're evaluating people or filtering based upon where they go to school or major. So we're only recruiting computer science majors. Well, what about the philosophy major that's been coding as a hobby for 20 years? Again, they're, they're, the traditional processes are missing out on that. And, and let's be clear that the solution isn't throw out post-secondary education, but it's find new ways to engage the students and, and access and assess them. And again, sorry for my third soapbox of the conversation. No, 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 that's, that's all right. But I, I do want to get around to this point. So um, yes, you have students from a range of disciplines, but from the business point of view, in terms of implementing a micro internship program, there are some goals that you can achieve through this in, in, by equipping those students to use processes that are distinctive to your industry. So I, I want to ask Julie about that. How does, how does this help you meet your business goals? Great question. Um, so like I mentioned before, we need to, we need to, ex I only get a paycheck as long as I can prove my value to HubSpot and um, showing up during my performance review and saying I do good things and I work with Jeffrey and students get employed because of me is really not enough. It's great. Um, it's what helps me kind of like sleep at night knowing that I'm doing good in the world, but it is not enough for me to stay at HubSpot. So um, I've said this before, and I'll go into more specifics as well, like kind of concrete things that you can do, um, but laying that foundation and beating the drum of um, making sure that everything that you, there's kind of a hub and spoke model and everything that you do is connected back to, and we're doing this because it's good for the business. Um, one thing that I learned is our program got a lot of attention. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, after the pandemic, because we were at the intersection of equity, inclusion, education, and also we were completely online, right? So the, I don't want to say it's a silver lining because it's horrible, but we got a lot of attention from internal folks at HubSpot, people with a lot of resources that wanted to help us out. And so we got very good at holding up a mirror to them and showing them whatever they wanted to see because we wanted their money, we wanted their attention. And then we lost that narrative, which I take accountability for, right? So we, and I, the reason why I say it's so important to prove your business value is because I've been in a situation where we're so good at talking about how we do good in the world that people forget that we're actually a really important part of the business. We're a very cheap way to skill people up, a no cost way, really, except for our paychecks, a no cost way to skill people up, to build brand awareness uh, of HubSpot very early in someone's career, or maybe when they're revisiting their, their career, changing their career. Um, so there's really no reason why people should doubt our business value. But if you hold, if you get used to holding that mirror up because it gets you attention, it gets you money, it gets you time, it gets you energy from other people, then you will lose that narrative. So make sure you bang that drum. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Um, I've kind of diverged from the question, but um, all of that to say, um, when we talk about the successes of the micro internship, we also want to ground it in reality. So having some sort of quantifiable metric of success is really important. And like I said, my ethos, as you can probably imagine, is under promise, over deliver. Say 20 students, HubSpot has 6,000 people. We're doing very well as a business. There's no reason we couldn't have had said 60, right? But we said 20 students and 20 customers, and we'll be happy. Under promise and over deliver, which is what we're doing. Um, so, like I said before, don't let anyone take that narrative away from you. You want to do this with intention, you want to make sure that you're doing it well, and usually that means, at least in our case, you start very small. Um, and then, again, we came from zero to 20, right? So that, that is accomplishment enough. And I have to say from my experience at HubSpot, everyone is very impressed because they don't know that 60 could have been our goal. They just know that 20 was the goal that we communicated. So. Also, um, one thing that I want to say in case anyone here is listening that is kind of in a similar position as me, we're a non-revenue generating team. We, um, are, we work very closely with education, which I think gives people sometimes an icky feeling of like corporate, like corporate companies in, in the classroom, like what does that mean? Um, but at the end of the day, we really need to prove that business value. And so we want to set those quantitative goals that are small, that are realistic, that are manageable. And then we also want to have that very steady foundation of we are, we prove 
We are a valuable part of this business. And we make sure that we close that loop. If you kind of consider a student's career circle, right? It starts maybe in kindergarten and it goes through college. We're letting, we were letting students down at that last mile. We were letting students down because they didn't have the experience they needed to get the jobs that they want. So micro internships are one way of kind of plugging that leaky, leaky faucet. Um, but there are other things that we're doing as well, which leads me to my third point, last thing. Um, micro internships cannot be the only thing that you are doing. Um, this is not a Band-Aid. Uh, so when you are trying to engage with HBCUs and those students that I mentioned earlier who have a very good BS radar, if applied learning is the only applied learning and showing up to career fairs is the only thing you're doing. Again, it's sad to say it is not enough. You have to have this thread, you know, the business value that I mentioned earlier, but you have to have this thread consistent narrative of what it is that you're doing. Um, so other things that we're doing, we're connecting solutions partners, which are, I'm using that word often, but basically those are resellers of HubSpot. So um, agencies, you might know that word a little bit better, um, but agencies with colleges, because a lot of agencies want to get involved with their local colleges. They want to talk about their careers. Like what other opportunity is there to talk about yourself and have it help someone else? To talk about your own experience as you entered your career and have it help someone else. So a lot of agencies, there's a thirst for that and a hunger for that. So we're facilitating that as well. Um, HubSpot itself has posted micro internships. So we're actually one of the 20. So I guess 19 customers have posted at this point, or rather we've beat that. So something around 30, but we're one of them. So we're, we're testing this out as well. Um, we're showing that we have skin in the game because we wanna know how this works for our customers. Um, so that was very long, but basically the, the, the kind of like the remnants of all the water that boiled up, like the, the nuts and bolts of it, is that make sure that you're proving your value to the business, make sure you are beating the drum very consistently on the one or two or three messages around applied learning, around skills gap, around whatever it is that you want. So it's not just, oh, all of a sudden Julia's talking about a skills gap. Like, I didn't know that was important to her. I, now she's asking for money about it. I didn't know that, I don't know why she's doing that. Um, so you wanna have that consistency throughout the, the months, the years that you're working on these projects and, and leading but and by the way, you are revenue generating now. I mean, HubSpot got a, a new client. HubSpot got a new client because of this program. Um, so you are revenue generating, but you're also, again, you're hitting a key point, which is talk to the stakeholders about the pain that they have. If it is a busy marketing professional, talking about closing the skills gap might not be top of mind. So focus on this is going to give you a resource to help you offload work that's on your plate, which is a very different conversation than if you're talking with the university recruiter that's struggling to achieve diversity goals, where this can help you engage students at different schools who might not be thinking about your organization. We're not suggesting be out there with two different messages or that these messages conflict, they don't. They're all aligned to that same big picture, but focus on the point of pain of the various stakeholder and how this makes their life better first and foremost, and you'll find the rest of it builds around. Well, thank you both so much. Um, this has been a great discussion about uh, just a complimentary tool to a lot of the tools that people have been using for a while for talent development that can really fill a niche for people, um, especially um, like HUDSOT, you're trying to make sure that students are armed with, um, in, with you know, contact with your product as they go out into the world into their own careers as well that's a big deal um, lots of business goals being met just with that but also the 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 goals of would have would like to um, being met so thank you very much to both of you um, on behalf of uidp um, thank you all for joining us for this session of uidp connect 2021 and we hope you will join us for our next session which really just flows beautifully into what we've just been talking about engaging HBCUs beyond talent. So getting those relationships in place so you can even do more. Please rate the session on the homepage of the Attendee Hub. You can 